All right. Well, good morning. Good morning to all of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll be starting there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look with me there in verses 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. The Scripture says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the precious word of God this morning. And we do ask you, Lord, to sharpen our sword, that we might, Lord, know how to properly apply this scripture. God, help me to be a good preacher. Help me to be a good communicator. The things that you have given to me, Lord, may I give this morning to everyone that hears uh, the sound of my voice. And Lord, that you would speak on the inside, challenge us, Lord, and help us to... Uh, be all that we can be as far as carrying the Great Commission to a lost and perishing world. In Jesus' name we ask, Amen. Amen. And so, we enter into this passage of Scripture. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's setting a foundation to explain his position and his purpose in life, that God has called him to preach the gospel. He's called him to preach Christ and not to focus on the mechanisms of religion, such as baptism and whatever other kind of religious mechanism that is out there, that uh, Paul's calling and our calling as Christians ought to be to preach the gospel. And yet he, he gives us a paradox here in verse 18. He says to us, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And that's why I want to focus this, this morning. Uh, the cross is an offense. It says in first, Second Corinthians, we'll get there in a little bit. But... Uh, the, the, to, to the ones we are preaching to, uh, and they deem or they perceive that what we're preaching is foolishness, it's foolishness because they are perishing. Now, the paradox is this, is that those we are communicating the gospel with, those that we are preaching to, are perishing, and they do not know they're perishing. You see, they mock, they, they scorn the message, they laugh at the message, and we'll look at some other verses in reflection of this, but uh, the, 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 uh, the paradox is that they are perishing. They have no concept. They have no idea that they are perishing. They have no idea that they're under the wrath of God. Uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, I believe, verse 38 that the wrath of God bideth on them. And they don't even know that the wrath of God is abiding on them. What they, The very thing that could save them, the very thing that could enlighten their heart and bring understanding to them, they call foolishness because they are perishing. So for us, it's a paradox. How do we establish a connection with the world that thinks that what we have is foolishness and uh, unequipped to be able to really take care of their needs. It's foolishness to them, and yet they are perishing. How do, we, how do we reach that type of a person? How do we bring them under the banner of the cross of salvation? How do we uh, cause their heart and their mind to uh, really begin to reflect and think about the state of their soul? And so, this is what I want to focus on this morning for just a little while. And uh, in the context here, I believe Paul really gives us a key understanding of why these people think that what we have for them is foolishness, and why 
uh, in that foolishness, they are perishing and, not, and don't even know that they're perishing. Uh, Paul gives us a little bit of insight here. So I just got three things I want to mention this morning that I think um, are worthy of really taking a look at because within these three points, it is clear that these are the very things that have caused them to be perishing and have caused them not to realize the state of their soul that they indeed are perishing. I hope that makes sense. Look with me there in this chapter, chapter 1. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is the reason why men are not understanding their position is one of perishing is because of men's intellect. Men's intellect. Men just get this idea that they are smarter uh, than God. Look with me there in verses 23 and 24. The scripture says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So he gives us the contrast of those that are perishing and those that are saved and understand and have experienced the power of God. What is the gap between this group and that group? It is the fact that the Jews think uh, it's a stumbling block to them and the Greeks call it foolishness. And, and the, the wisdom of God just cannot get a hold of their mind because they think they're smarter. They have a greater understanding of what it means to be saved. And... This, this has been an issue throughout history, if you will, where men have fallen and uh, succumbed to philosophies and concepts and religious ideas, traditions and culture, and all of these different uh, influences uh, raise the intellect of man to the point where they just do not feel they need God at all. They do not comprehend that outside of the message they are perishing. They're indeed blind to it because of their own intellect. And uh, Romans chapter 2 kind of gives us a little insight here because somehow you and I, as we present the Word of God, as we present salvation to men, we need to realize that most people are going to turn a deaf ear to what we have to say. They're not going to listen. They are perishing. And it's our duty. It's our mandate. It's our commission to try to get them to realize the state of their soul. That they indeed are perishing. And so, therefore we're going to have to deal with their intellect. Uh, when you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll find the story of the sower uh, with the seed. And of course, the, the seed is the Word of God. And, and one of the very first things in Matthew, the Scripture says, uh, the seed went to the wayside, and he describes the seed that went to the wayside was the one who did not understand. Somehow, we're going to have to get people to begin to think about the state of their soul. We're going to have to get people to really process their mind. And I know in today's world that's rather difficult because many people are not using their mind. Uh, they are just mimicking what they see or what they hear. And they're not really uh, exercising critical thinking. They're not rationalizing through their mind uh, the, the necessity of being saved and or indeed it's not even being presented to them in a way that would challenge the way they're thinking. But that's our job. That's where we come in. That's where we have to be um, uh, smart enough, if you will, to try to help men realize that their intellect is not equipped. It is not enough. It is not capable of saving them. And, and so our job is to try to strip away every ounce of security from their life. And so one of the secure things that people have is the way they think, their intellect. And, uh, and so we find in, in Romans chapter 2, uh, Paul gives us a little bit of insight of the way people think. The scripture says in verses 14, we'll just start there, Romans chapter 2 verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, 
do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, that is the, the Ten Commandments, the written word of God, are a law unto themselves. How is this? Verse 15, for uh, which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the means while excu uh, accusing or else excusing one another. So, when we begin to approach men, humanity, on the area of the gospel and their need to be saved, and the state of their soul, that they are perishing, we're going to have to hit this on an informational level. We're going to have to hit this in the intellect of their mind. We're going to have to uh, we're going to have to take their conscience and I, I I say this rather uh, in a peculiar way because a lot of people have lost their conscience. They just don't have a conscience anymore. But many, many people do. And Paul reflects this in uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to have to get them to own up to what they know about their own conscience. See, most people don't obey their conscience. There's a lot of Christians out there that don't fully obey their conscience. Indeed, that's why we need the Lord. And we need to bring them to this place where they realize that they are not in good standing with God. And their conscience, of which God gave to them, is one of these tools, one of these mechanisms built within the human heart, built within the mind, that we can use to cause men to realize that they have been disobedient to the conscience, they have not been obedient to God, their, uh, their intellect is not enough, and begin to solely peel away the intellect that they have rested upon, the philosophies they have rested upon, the culture, the tradition, the family, the friends, all these different things they have rested upon, and cause them to realize, hey, you know, I don't think I'm right with God. Something isn't right in my life between me and God. And bring them to this place. So, why are these people perishing and they do not know? Because they're resting in the intellect, uh, uh, the, the security of, of the way they think. And somehow we've got to get to their, their mind and their heart, applying the Word of God in such a way that uh, they realize they are not in good standing with God. Paul also in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 24. This is our commission. This is our commission. 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. So you and I, our job, our commission is to bring this truth to them in such a way that begins to wear upon their conscience, wear upon all the security of their intellect and cause them to realize that they indeed are perishing and they need the gospel truth. And so Men are blind to these things because of their own intellect. Secondly, <clears throat> secondly, I refer to the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8 gives us some real insight to materialism. Why are men perishing? Why can't they comprehend their state before God? Uh, once again, we have to peel away every area of security out of the life. And of course, materialism is a huge issue in America. Covetousness is a huge issue in America. And indeed, if the power went out in America, America would fall apart, wouldn't know how to live. But I just want to go through these passages of Scripture uh, to remind you the effects of materialism, and it's shown to us in the parable of the sower of the seed in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. If you look there with me, 
Jesus is explaining, uh, opening up the parable <clears throat> to the apostles, to, to the disciples, and he, he tells us about the seed uh, that is sown among thorns. And this is where I want to focus the next uh, few verses here because Jesus talks about materialism in this passage of Scripture. And he tells us the effect of it. Matthew chapter 13, verse uh, 22, he says, He also, uh, he also that s received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. And so this is just a small portion of the other verses here. We're going to look at all three of them to give us a full picture of how materialism literally blinds and chokes the word of God out of the life of somebody, where, as it says here, they becometh unfruitful. What is this? This is materialism, the deceitfulness of riches. We know the scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And the more I study about the banking system and how it influences nations and countries and governments, indeed, I see a lot of evil there because of the covetousness of riches in money. But let's move to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, and uh, get a little more insight here about materialism and the effects of it <clears throat> on an individual. Mark chapter 4, look there with me in verse 19. It says here in verse 19, Mark chapter 4, The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Let me back up verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. They hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And so here we see again the, the deceitfulness of of riches and the lust of other things. Uh, these are material objects. You, you, you know, uh, material things are obtained by money. And I have watched and observed this over the years. I've just recently seen this, and, 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 and so it kind of jogged my, my memory that uh, someone will get a job or they'll get a, a large amount of money. And they'll become secure in that money. They'll become secure in that uh, material uh, uh, monetary uh, moment, if you will. And they'll go and buy stuff. And uh, uh, they can't, uh, you know, pay for it. They, they really, uh, they, they work off credit. They'll get a credit card and they'll start to buy stuff. And, they, and all of a sudden they lose that monetary fund. That They lose their job. They lose that security. And they fall into debt. What is this? It's just the deception of money. It's the lust. It's the lust. Uh, for, for other things. It's the lust for other things. What is it? Materialism. Pleasures. And we'll see this in the other verse here. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Look there with me as well. As we go through these passages, you begin to really, a picture begins to be painted that shows us the effects of materialism in the life of an individual. And indeed, this is one of the things that causes people to not realize that they're perishing. They've placed their security in houses and homes and cars and jobs and um, all of the good things of life, if you will. And it, indeed, they, they're perishing, but they don't realize it because they've placed their trust in these things. Mark, or excuse me, Luke chapter 8. Let me go there. Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> Look there with me in verse... 14, Luke chapter 8, I believe that's right, Luke chapter 8 verse 14, and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. 
and bring no fruit to perfection. And so we see once again the, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the, the cares of riches, and the pleasures of this life, the lusts for other things. These things are materialism. And people place a lot of trust in these things, and they're powerful things, and they feel secure in them, and they do not realize they're perishing. So somehow, you know, we have to approach humanity. America, to a large degree, is really well off. We got one of the largest middle class societies in the world, and uh, there's a lot of materialism out there that have caused people to trust in things instead of trusting in the living God and realizing the state of their soul and uh, their need for salvation. So we have to just come, come to a place where we realize that uh, these people are trusting these things and we have to peel away, peel away their security and cause them to run. I believe it starts with the intellect and indeed will flow down to the material things that they have. But then thirdly, there was one other thing. Go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I suppose there are many other things that cause people to be secure, not realize that they are perishing. But these are three that just came the surface as I begin to think about this passage of Scripture or opening passage of Scripture. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we need to realize also, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we need to realize also that we are in a spiritual warfare. We are in a battle. Uh, we are in the battle for the soul. And that one-on-one -on -one pure intellect is not enough. We can be a great orator, we can be a great convincer, we can be a great debater. Well, there's a lot of ways we can present information and truth. But outside of realizing that we are dealing with a spiritual entity that has blinded, that has blinded these people that are perishing, uh, we will have no effect on them at all. So we enter these things in, in prayer, in confidence that God's Word... God's Spirit will enlighten the heart of these individuals, and, and that's our mandate. Look there with me. Satan has blinded them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, But if our gospel be hid, see there it is, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, those that are perishing. They can't see it. They can't understand it. Why is this? Because of intellect, because of materialism, because it says here in verse 4, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And there's the key. Lest the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We are the ones who carry the glorious gospel to the world that is perishing. And it's our job to realize that uh, when we go forth, Satan is there, as in the parable of the sower, he is right there. As soon as we sow the word of God, he is there to try to swoop up and take the word out of the life of that individual. And we've got to get them to a point where they at least or, or make effort uh, where they begin to understand something about the Word of God. And so here we see this, and we'll go back to um, our other passage of Scripture there. I believe it was Second Timothy. Second Timothy, because Paul also brings out another point to this in Second Timothy. Uh, Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, the very last verse, we already read these other verses here, that the servant of the Lord must not strive and so forth, be meek to instruct those that oppose themselves, and they don't realize they're opposing themselves, and you know, there's a lot of suffering out there, and there's a lot of, uh, the, if you will, the judgment of sin, and you know, you know I've seen people really go through a lot of... Um, 
uh, destruction by their own choice and by their own sinful choices and you think boy this is this is it they're gonna wake up they're gonna really comprehend they're gonna understand um, but they keep going on into the same lifestyle that is so destructive to them and so they oppose themselves they're living in a destructive life style and they, they just can't see uh, what is going on and so it's our job to try to awaken their heart to the gospel truth but he, he gives us some more insight here in verse 26 and that uh, they may be they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by or by him at his will and so this is a very powerful uh, passage of scripture that really tells us we're in spiritual warfare here we need to approach these things with great a great deal of prayer a great deal of confidence that God's word and faith uh, will do the job it needs to be done to awaken those people we're trying to reach out to and I know that uh, having uh, been in the ministry for a while now we can get discouraged because people don't respond the way we expect them to respond and it's not our job really to uh, make them respond this is something they have to enact upon themselves they have a free will and as we apply the Word of God as we uh, begin to uh, approach them in these different ways realizing that we are in spiritual warfare and that only God can open their heart only God can open their mind only the Holy Spirit can do this work not ourself lest we trust in ourself and God does not receive the glory in that so these three things I think are are pertinent to our topic here a passage of scripture in reference to they they think it's foolishness why because they're perishing well there's some reasons why uh, they're perishing here uh, they and and these three particular things I think are always working you know even even in a poverty stricken area of our country these things are working there's a, a desire for materialism uh, there's uh, a uh, an intellect there the the street wise if you will um, instead of the wisdom of God they have uh, the wisdom of the world and they're operating within that wisdom and therefore they're trusting in that intellect and then of course whether you're rich or in the middle class or down in the dumps there's the blindness that Satan brings because of unbelief and it, it is our job it is our job as believers uh, to take the word and do our best to try to apply it to the heart and mind of an individual trusting God to do the rest that uh, you know uh, the the result is really not up to us the result is not up to us that's up to God we are uh, planting we're, we're plowing we're planting we're watering and every now and then we'll also be reaping or someone may reap where we have sowed uh, someone may reap or we have watered uh, and, and so forth and so on this is the work of the kingdom of God and so I just want to uh, leave you with that in Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 I'll close uh, with this because that is the a warfare chapter if you will Ephesians chapter 6 he says to us finally my brethren in verse 10 finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might I, I know for myself I have not always commended myself to this passage of Scripture and I dare say through my years of ministry and walking with the Lord I have seen other preachers and ministers not adhere to this as well sometimes we lean on our own strength and we lean on our own intellect and we don't really include God in our approach to ministry we need to be very careful about this Paul concludes with the Ephesus church finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that ye might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take ye, unto your, a whole, take ye unto the whole armor of God, that ye might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the, gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all things, the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so, dear Christian, I encourage you to be equipped in the Word of God. It is the tool by which God has given us to follow out and to uh, establish His uh, commission in this world. And without it, without it, we have no hope. So I trust that you'll be encouraged in this and, and be challenged to study the Word and to uh, apply the word to your own life and then and learn it in such a way that you can give it back out to humanity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your precious word. And I've tried to communicate in a, in a very simple way, Lord, and challenge uh, Christians. And we pray, God, that you would help us as we go throughout our daily work and our daily employment and whatever station of life you have us in, that you would be preeminent and we would be walking with you and talking with you, and being able to talk to others about you, our Savior and our Lord. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.